sure it's sheer coincidence that Sean and I are going one after the oh, other. Oh, it's just schedules, you know, you gotta balance yeah. these things. Yeah. Um, look, we're gonna talk some about what, what, uh, what Sean said, but I wanna start first, um, you know, more broadly, uh, you know, with the trade desk. So. I, I actually went back and looked at your guys' uh, IPO filing, and you guys have been talking about this concept of the open internet mm -hmm. for the whole time, right? Uh, you are the, like, the people that are protecting the open internet. You're here to drive the open internet. Um, I think when, the, when you guys IPO, that was very clear what the open internet was. As we're talking now, it's, it's a little less clear, right? We've got you know, wall gardens, hedge gardens. Um, you know, CTV, all these ecosystems. So maybe just to, to start, it'd be great to just understand what do you mean by the open internet today? Like, what does that mean for the trade desk? Um, and then, yeah, we'll go from there. Sure, so when we talk about the open internet, we're talking about premium content. It's actually the place where consumers spend the majority of their time, whether it's streaming their favorite television show, listening to their favorite podcast or songs, or even going to their favorite news outlet to access journalism. We compare this to many of the walled gardens that frequently have a lot of UGC, or user-generated content. That could be potentially hate speech. It could be 12-year-olds falling off their skateboards. You know, there's a whole spectrum of content that we are comparing ourselves to. Of course, on the open internet, we make sure that we are um, vigilantly watching for things like MFA or made for advertising sites. So for us, protecting our buyers against that is just table stakes. And we've seen advertisers continue to lean into programmatic and they're doing so because it's really driving their performance in a transparent way that holds their trust. We've seen these large inventory ecosystems continue to lean in. I mean, even just in the past few weeks, we've announced expansions in our partnership with Disney, with Roku, with LG. There's so many of them that continue to lean in and embrace programmatic, and it's because of the results that advertisers get. And of course, we're working to continue to innovate that. So we talked about Kokai, which is the upgrade of our platform. And one of the components there is something we call the Sellers and Publishers 500 Plus. And that's pulling together the best access of inventory across the open internet to make it easy for advertisers to buy in a brand suitable way that still transparently delivers performance. Got it. So I mean, the open internet shifting to premium internet, I mean, in some ways, it's shifting to uh, larger brands, right? Because the, uh, I mean, there's UGC on the open internet, you said. There's MFAs, and then there's also blogs and all the rest, right? There's a long tail of content, and it's open, right? Anyone can publish or create a website. So does that, does that get left behind as it shifts towards the premium in, in internet? Or what's the, what's the differentiation there if you think about uh, open, closed? I mean, is the distinction more that it's on a single platform and the, and the you know, internet is, anyone can use it? I'm, I'm, like, how does, does that mean MFA is now every blog site and, and uh, you know, longer tail platform? Yeah, so a couple thoughts packed into that one. I would say, you know, one element is the connectivity. So the fact that advertisers can understand who they're reaching across sites. Yep. We want to make sure that an advertiser can understand that I'm listening to this particular podcast, and then they showed me the same advertisement while I was reading the news, and the same one while I was watching television, so that they can control for frequency, they can understand what's driving performance. So some of it has to do with what information can be accessed. Another element is what data can be applied. You know, you talked a lot about commerce media, making sure that our advertisers have access to rich data assets like retail that's consented that can be anchored across these ecosystems. But I do think, you know, if you look at a lot of the UGC, you know, think about how many hours of content is put forward on YouTube every single second. Or think about the 200 million accounts on Amazon Prime that now all have ads. How is an advertiser going to be able to control effectively what they're advertising next to when there's so much subtlety that's present in syntax? You know, we talk a lot about X and some of the troubles that they've had. I'm gonna stay out of the whole DV <laughs> debacle around 99.9% .9 safe. Um, but uh, you know, the reality is that when you have all of these different creators coming to bear, they are not all created equal. And so, of course, we just heard about some of these incredible names that are truly marquee personalities, but those are the exception rather than the rule when you look at the sheer quality, or sorry, when you look at the sheer content of creators that are present on those platforms and figuring out how to balance where you want to show up and understanding what's driving that performance, I think is really important from a brand's perspective. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe another way to frame it is, um, 
where consumers are opting in. Increasingly on platforms, it's an algorithm sort of showing you the next thing, right? On MFA sites, you might be clicking something you're not sure where you're landing. If you're at the longer tail, you know what you're clicking onto, right? It's in the open internet. Um, there's more of an op, like consumers are making a conscious choice um, in, in many of those uh, frameworks. I would say consumers are choosing to interact with content, but it's important that we focus on transparency and understand what's happening within that supply chain so that we can make sure we're adding accountability, that we're getting the right signal in to be able to understand the metadata of the impression, that we can correctly understand who the user is, that they've got the chance to provide authenticated information, that they're clear of the value exchange that's happening. Um, so I think there's a number of different factors that are at play in terms of how they're expecting their experience to unfold as they're on those sites. Yep, makes sense. Um, the other uh, sort of clear through line between a lot of this is, is the ability to access data, have addressability, um, you know, authenticate users, um, all the rest. So obviously we've got to talk about data deprecation. Uh, you know, we just heard from Sean, he's, he's just one of us uh, in the ecosystem, you know, responding to what Chrome is doing as well. Uh, you know, any reactions there? Well, I, so I'm curious, how many of you were surprised that the cookie deprecation deadline was delayed? Yeah. Anyone, right? It's the least surprising surprise that we've had all year. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple pieces in it. I would say one is looking at the sandbox, for example, you know, Google has been transparent that they have given the industry, as they put it, building blocks and not solutions. And Google continues to change what those building blocks are. So they're changing the amount of noise that's injected, the lag time and conversion APIs, the number of identity, uh, number of IDs and interest groups. It's all in flux. And they've got all of these things that are coming soon. So fenced frames, 2026. This piece, we're going to offload it in a few years. It's really hard to build a solution on building blocks that continue to change. And they're putting that on the publishers. So we've talked a lot about impacts that the publishers may experience. The reality is it has never been harder to be a publisher. You know, if I think about some of the search algorithms that are pulling data from quality journalistic sites and surfacing it in the search results, now that user is not going to that original site to understand the context of that information or learn more about it. That also means that that publisher is losing that ad inventory opportunity. And so you're coupling that in these resource constrained publishing environments where you're taking traffic away from them, you've got increased competition from all of these other mediums that are emerging, and now you're saying, I'm gonna give you building blocks that you need to figure out how to build your business on top of that continue to morph. That's an incredibly hard position to be in as a publisher. And I don't envy Google's position either. I mean, if you look at the CMA report and the ICO findings, they didn't just point out a couple of minor tweaks. There are some major concerns that will be really challenging to overcome. And so I think that Google is also stuck in a rock and a hard place. But my view is that I am actually most surprised that we as an industry still spend so much time talking about cookie deprecation, the will they, won't they of Google. You know, 40% of browser traffic already doesn't have cookies on it today, and advertising can still work there. When we think about these emerging ecosystems like in-app or audio or streaming television, cookies were never present. And that's why I think it's so important to think about alternative identifiers, whether it's UID 2.0, whether it's EUID in Europe, or any of the other authenticated identity consented solutions that are available in market. We need to think about a consumer's identity across all of these channels instead of just isolating it for display, which is totally separate from audio, which is totally separate from TV, because it's one single consumer experience, and we need to market to the consumer, not just a specific device. To totally agree. I mean, I think it, it feels like the, the ecosystem across the board needs the Band-Aid ripped off. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess, like, don't disagree. We need to move on. People need to build towards there's, there's alternative opportunities. And yet this, this crutch of the cookie <laughs> remains, right? And so we're, we, we remain in purgatory uh, around this. I mean, do you... It, just like your opinion, do you think we will, people will start to move past it now? I mean, the first time delay, sure, okay, we're gonna get it soon. The second time delay, you know, this is the third or fourth time Lucy has pulled the, you know, uh, metaphorical cookie here. Uh, do you think in the next year we can start to see that traction? Because uh, I know from our end, it, you know, it's like, yeah, there's lots of innovation, there's lots of opportunity. We don't know yet what marketers care about because everything is still backed up by a cookie or some other you know, identifier. Yep, totally. So we've seen hundreds and hundreds of publishers lean in to UID 2.0. So I do think that there's a huge amount of lean in. 
What I think the delay in deprecation gives us is the opportunity to increase authentication. And that's something that I think a lot of publishers really need to focus on today. So we see some authentication rich environments like CTV and audio that say, no problem, my users are almost entirely authenticated. I'm in a great place. What I worry about are the publications that say, I've got 5% user authentication. Yep. And we're seeing this unfold in a couple of ways. One is that users go to these sites and they're so worried about interrupting the experience. They know how fragile their traffic is. But I believe that consumers are coming there because they want to interact with that brand and that brand needs to create a way to create value exchange for those consumers. To date, many of those companies used a third-party SSO to try to get consumers to authenticate. They said, look, this is much easier. They already recognize Apple. They recognize Google. So I'm going to have them log in through their front door. The problem with outsourcing the single most important asset you have, your conversation with your customer, is you're now dependent on this third party to help authenticate. So Apple, for example, with their SSO, now has defaulted to a burner email address. So even if I'm willing to provide the publisher with my actual email address, I've got to go through multiple clicks to be able to do so. So the rate of email capture coming in through the Apple SSO has a significantly higher rate of burner email addresses that these publishers then can't connect into inventory or data and can't monetize effectively. Similarly with Google, I tried to log into TripAdvisor this weekend using my Google SSO, and it said, you have to go to YouTube's app to get your verification code. I don't even have YouTube on my telephone, so now instead of logging into TripAdvisor, I've got to go to the App Store, download YouTube, get my verification code to go back to TripAdvisor. It's a terrible user experience. You have to do that even if you don't have the app? Yeah, even if I don't have the app, they crossed wow. out the send me a text message. It was not an option I could check, and I had to go to the App Store. And so it's one of those challenges where I'm sure the intention was the consumer recognizes the Google brand, I'm gonna make it easy for them to authenticate, and yet the reality of that consumer experience is incredibly challenging. And so our view is that customers will likely only have unique logins for 10 to 15 websites. You don't want to have to go log in everywhere, which is why we've created OpenPass, which is a cross-publisher SSO. This idea of how can I create an email address, sorry, how can I create an account? I'll give my email address, I'll get my verification code, but then when I go to publisher site number two or number three, all I have to do is hit OK. And so my perspective is it's all about giving publishers the opportunities to get users to authenticate, but they need to really make sure that they're in control of what that experience is, that they're getting the actual consumer information that the consumer is intending to provide so that they can preserve that value exchange with their consumers in perpetuity and be back in the driver's seat. Yeah, they did the hard work, right? They, they got someone to come to their site to read their content because it's their content. They're willing to give some information and yet they don't get to use it. So yeah. totally agree. Um, on that sort of thread, I mean, we often talk in, in these rooms about ad tech, we talk about the marketers, and we talk about the publishers, and we don't often talk about the consumers, right? And as we move to this world of authenticated data and more, you know, giving over your email address, um, you know, certainly UID 2.0, OpenPass are, are tied towards email, you know, Arguably, you could say email is more personal than cookie, right? When I was, you know, whatever long digit of numbers, it's less personal than the email that I'm giving over. Um, how do you think consumers are figuring this out? I mean, one, do you think consumers have any idea what's going on, cookies or otherwise, um, other than having to click accept all cookies at the bottom of every screen? Um, and, and do you think the, the notion of giving your data willingly changes the perception of the advertising or, or the data that they're sharing? Yeah, so I'd probably break it into two parts. You know, when you think about is an email address more private than a cookie, I would actually argue most consumers, if you said, tell me what your cookie is, tell me how you clear your cookies, tell me where you find your cookie, they would have no idea. They'd be looking for the basket of cookies next to you, right? If you say, what's your email address? How do you go opt out of your email address receiving something? That is something they understand. So I actually think an identifier anchored off of an email address or a phone number is a much more accessible concept for a consumer. I also think we've done a pretty poor job of explaining the value exchange of the internet. Yeah. So frequently we'll say to customers, do you want to receive ads? And the natural answer is, I'd prefer not to. But CTV streaming actually is the perfect example of what consumers prefer. Many of those networks started with subscription-based only offerings. 
And what they found was that customers would actually prefer to pay with their time. They'd rather watch advertisements in exchange for free or reduced content, which is why all of the major CTV ecosystems now have an ad-supported model. And I think the same is true if you think about the internet. If you say to them, do you want to have ads, many may say no. If you say, are you willing to pay 15 bucks a month for Facebook when you look at what they launched? No. Are you willing to pay a quarter every time you want to search for something on Google? No. And so you need to think about not just what's occurring, but what the inverse looks like. Or similarly, if you think about customer data that's being provided, not just ads, but targeted ads, do you want to have 30 ads pop up that are irrelevant, or do you want two that are things you may be interested in? And so I think it's always important to compare access to this incredible content only comes because they're able to pay for journalists to be able to do the research, for content creators to be able to pull this together, and they're able to do so through advertising. And so I think instead the focus should be on how can we create a better consumer experience? You know, you guys talked about all of the different emerging ad formats. I think about our opportunities to interact with customers in such a tailored way that enriches their life, that makes it so that it enhances or provides new ideas versus the legacy linear way of saying, like, quick, we've got this 20-minute ad break. I'm going to go run to the bathroom, get my snacks, whatever it may be. And so I think there's an opportunity to innovate and continue to add value for consumers in a transparent way that still gives them choice and control. I hope we're not heading to 20-minute ad breaks. <laughs> Sorry. 20 minutes over the hour hour of television, yep. Um, all right, I wanted to, to shift topics here to, to AI and optimization. Um, obviously, there's a lot of focus here, um, and all the wall gardens are coming out with their pluses. So you've got you know Performance Max, uh, Advantage Plus, and then the Amazon's is the combination, Performance Plus or something like that recently, um, where you know the, the notion there is, you know, Give us the range. We're going to give you, you know, we're going to give you results. Um, I think Sean talked about, you know, they talked about the notion of transparency and control, and he said what people think they want with transparency is control, um, but what we they really want is results. So, you know, again, let us let us do this for you. Um, I mean, I'd love your reaction to that as well as just, you know, how is. What are you guys doing from an open internet or premium internet perspective around how you're using AI optimization? Um, how is it comparing to you know, those platforms? Because obviously there's a lot of focus on what Pmax and those, those things are doing. I think broadly, it's got to be really challenging as an advertiser to say, I'm having partner X buy on my behalf. And by the way, they own a ton of their own supply that they need to monetize as well. So they're going to say, I looked high and low, and good news. I own all of the inventory that you should advertise next to. How do, I, how do you know it's working? No worries, I crunched the numbers and my analysis said I did great. You know, that's a really challenging um, through line to follow as a CMO to be able to justify how it is you allocated those budgets, which is why CMOs have the shortest tenure of any C-level executive, right? I mean, it's a really tough spot to be in. Um, we believe in transparency. We believe in giving our advertisers choice. Uh, but we also recognize the value of machine learning or AI, which is why we've pulled in the opportunity for advertisers to bring incredible first-party data assets to bear. We, of course, want to complement that with the amazing retail assets that we have available on the platform, as well as other third-party offerings. And then we want to make sure that we're enriching that with AI. So we do that through what we call Kokai, because we recognize that we don't want to have the legacy approach of saying, I'm going to select an audience provider based on whomever had the most interesting PowerPoint that came to my office last week. Or I'm going to scroll and click through, and I'm going to hit anything that has the word fast food in it. You want machine learning to be put to work on your behalf to help select the right data assets based on what your campaign is trying to do, to make sure you're advertising at the optimal price point for those impressions, to make sure you understand who you're advertising to. But there also needs to be transparency and accountability. It can't just be, don't worry, I have this black box, and out the other side, I'll let you know how well I did, which is why we provide event-level data, which is why we work with so many amazing third-party providers, which is why we give advertisers data themselves so they can do their own analysis or marry it with other assets they have. So to me, I think that, yes, machine learning or AI has a place, but it can't replace transparency and trust. I think that's at the epicenter of everything we do. Makes sense. Um, so we are, we're out of time. We could easily talk for an hour up here. I have a lot more topics that I was hoping to get to. Um, before we go, uh, I'm required as a banker to ask you this question. Uh -oh. So. Um, the trade desk, uh, you know. Uh, the same conversation we had oh, last yeah, night. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, just in front of people. Um, 
You guys have done one acquisition in your history, uh, about $40 billion market cap today, $5 million acquisition about eight years ago. Um, can we expect that to change anytime soon? Or how do you guys think about the notion of build, buy, partner? Obviously, you do a lot of build, a lot of partner. Um, how does buy come into the equation? We are always looking for opportunities that could potentially make sense. So we um, spend a lot of time looking at what's possible. We also recognize how important it is that we prioritize the things that will matter most for our advertisers and do what's right by them. So we'll continue to keep an eye on things. All right, so we should keep calling Rohit then? Absolutely. All right, sounds yeah. good. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.